Hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, can everyone see me and hear me? Just type in the chat real quick. Excellent. Brilliant. OK. All right. Well, hello, everyone. Looks like we got a full house today. Um, wonderful. Uh, we are going to, uh, Kate, do you want to give it another minute just so people can uh, join in? Okay, so we're, we're going to give it a, a few seconds before we get started on the actual presentation. Um, uh, just real quick, we'll do all the intros. My name is Arnab Chatterjee. Uh, I'm going to be doing the, the presentation here from my apartment in Brooklyn. Um, we are all working from home now, um, so uh, obviously, you know, we we're kind of, you know, we may have some technical difficulties, but we spent some time making sure that our setup is better than last time. Um, so we're hardwired into the internet. We've got everything set up on, on Demio, and so hopefully things will run smoothly. All right. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and get started, and we are going to go to a quick presentation here. Um, so is everybody able to see the presentation? OK, great. Um, so uh, today we're going to be talking about cleaning a digital back. Um, and we are talking, by the way, just to specify here, we're talking about cleaning the, you know, the optical components of it. We're not talking about sanitizing it, uh, which is very important in this uh, particular climate. So I'll give you some. Uh, some tips for that actually at the at the end, but we're going to talk about the optical cleaning here. Um, and just to let you know who is all here today. Uh, again, I'm Arnab Chatterjee. I'm going to be doing kind of the moder the main presentation. Um, also, as presenters, we have uh, Mr. Joseph King, who is our support manager at DT. Uh, Joe, do you want to just quickly say hi? Broadcasting here from uh, New York as well uh, on the Manhattan Island. So nice to meet you all. All right. Uh, so that's Joseph King uh, and, of course, Kate Stone, our events manager, uh, who worked very hard to put this all together. So thank you, Kate. Kate is also available if you want to quickly say, hey, Kate. All right. Um, and also a quick shout out to our uh, sales reps and other folks from the company. And, and exactly, I know Wayne is in there. Um, to our sales reps and other folks from the company, if you just want to say hi in the chat uh, and let folks know you're there, um, we do have several people that are going to be uh, moderating the chat room. And so hopefully we'll be able to manage that in the main presentation a little bit uh, more efficiently than we did last time. So. Um, all right. Without further ado, Let's hop right into it. OK. Ah, no, no, no. How could I forget? We have our special guest star. OK, and so uh, today we are very, very lucky. We are joined by Mr. John Gilbert uh, from Phase One. He is the US support manager and uh, is a great resource for us. So John, would you like to say hi real quick? Uh, yeah, hi to everybody. I'm going to be chiming in here and there with uh, little bits of advice and uh, perhaps some, some stories from our experiences. Um, I'm out here in my dining room in Long Island at the moment. All right. And I can tell you that John, uh, the main reason that we have John here is to tell funny stories about people cleaning their sensors, uh, because there certainly are some, some great stories that, that he can tell you about that. Uh, so looking forward to those, John. All right. So first things first, number one thing that we hear when people are talking about cleaning their sensors is no, oh my God, absolutely no way I'm going to go in there, touch my sensor, ruin everything. You know, this is a very expensive camera system. I'm not going to go and do anything. And we totally understand that. All right. So we first want to kind of talk about uh, what exactly you'll be doing when you're cleaning your sensor, what the steps are and why. You know, it, it may not be as nerve wracking as you may think it is. All right. So first, we do want to acknowledge, um, you know, people ask us, of course, all the time. Can you clean our sensor? You know, can you clean my sensor for me? Uh, and the answer is absolutely, uh, with the exception of right now uh, when there is a pandemic. So 
Uh, typically, uh, we are available at our Los Angeles or New York locations. Uh, you can bring in uh, your, uh, your system to us, your phase one digital back, and we can schedule cleaning. We also have several tune-up days that we do throughout the country. Again, once things get back to normal, um, that's something that we do a couple times a year. Um, so be sure to stay tuned for that. All right. But uh, just so we know, uh, cleaning your sensor is, you know, I'm sorry, checking your sensor, which we're going to go over, is super safe and easy. You don't even have to take, take off your digital back. Um, and, and this is a really important point that John actually reminded me, which is, you're going to be working on the filter glass of your sensor, not directly on the sensor silicon itself. Um, so that part is absolutely replaceable, uh, and it's not nearly like you're going to be ruining the whole sensor. All of the kits that I'm going to be showing throughout this presentation are from DT. They're purpose-built for phase one digital backs. You're not going to have to do all of these steps every time, and of course, as I said, we're happy to do it for you. So let's jump right into it. Okay, um, so I also have a second camera here, uh, which I'm going to switch to now. Here on my keyboard, I'm gonna move this and we're gonna bring our digital back in. Um, actually, no, first things first, let me show you how we're gonna presentation for now, just so you can see the full screen, okay? Um, so everybody can see what I have here. This is a phase one XT with my IQ4 150 megapixel digital back on here. All of these steps are exactly the same for any phase one digital back. Um, there are slight variances which we'll cover. And what I've, what I've got is I've got it tethered up to uh, my computer here and uh, we're linked up in Capture One. So the first thing that I'm gonna do to check my sensor, like I said, I don't even have to take it off of my, of my camera to check it. I'm gonna take a piece of translucent, uh, you know, plastic, like a plexi here. This is an LCC plate. This is included with all uh, phase one digital backs. Um, anything will work as long as it's translucent, it lets light through, um, but it's going to obscure kind of what material is behind it. We're just gonna put this in front of our camera here. Uh, and then we're going to capture. So I'm gonna switch over to my capture one window right now, just so you can see exactly what that looks like. So let's see, share my screen, application, capture one. Okay. Um, just so, uh, John, uh, can you guys see our, my capture one window right now? Okay, great. So uh, this is a, a capture that I did previously. We'll see what this current one looks like. I'm just gonna hold it up here. Do a quick capture. And so I've got my, my file here. Um, and again, so your, you know, the exposure itself, you just wanna have it kind of anywhere between minus two and zero. It's not super important what your ISO is. Um, it's also not super important what your aperture is. Um, the most important thing is that you're getting enough light hitting the sensor. And as you're gonna see, everything is obscured anyway in terms of uh, like the forms that you're looking at um, through the lens. And so all we're getting is whatever's directly on the sensor is going to show up on our image. And the way you're gonna make that come through is you're gonna go over to your lens tab here and you're going to go to the LCC tool. Um, so lots of people probably know what this is. LCC stands for Lens Cast Calibration. Uh, all it's gonna do is it's gonna take my image and it's going to uh, assume that what I'm showing it should be completely uniform in terms of light. Uh, so we'll hit Create LCC and it's going to brighten that up for me in all the corners. The other thing it's gonna do is it's gonna enhance contrast and to really, really enhance our contrast, what we're gonna to wanna to do is do an auto levels. Again, that's in our exposure tab here. And in Capture 120, it's a little magic wand. In previous versions, it's a little A for auto. And when we click that, you're gonna see that we get this really high contrast looking uh, version of our sensor here. And so it's pretty apparent right off the bat, I've got a couple of spots. I've got one here, I've got one here. 
And uh, you know, this, this is not too bad. Um, I want to show you one that I shot earlier. Um, here you can see that you've got a big fuzzy thing on here. All right, and this is actually, you know, it may look scary, um, but this is one of the least concerning things that you'll see on there. Um, one of the giveaways is that you'll see that it's actually, it's kind of fuzzy and out of focus, whereas the spots directly on the sensor are much sharper. What that means is that it's not directly on the sensor plane. And what this was, was this was just a little piece of, of dust, a little piece of fuzz that was on the sensor. Um, and those are the easiest to remove. But, you know, this is step one. And I didn't have to do anything. It's not scary. I didn't have to take my digital back off. I didn't have to expose my sensor. All I do is I take my translucent card, I shoot it, I create my LCC, and then I do my auto levels. And that is going to give me my rough look at what that file looks like. Okay. Um, at this point, I'm going to just quickly check out the questions. Um, okay, so we have a question about whether the things that we're looking at are on the glass or on the sensor. Um, what we're looking at is, and this is a, a good chance to kind of hop in here. Uh, John, do you want to talk a little bit about what the difference is between, uh, you know, sort of the the filter glass and the sensor itself? Yeah. So, I mean, it, basically what you have um, is you have your sensor, um, and that's always covered up with, with some sort of a glass. Uh, now, in about 99.9% .9 of all digital backs out there, uh, that's an infrared filter made to uh, keep the light hitting the sensor as a uh, part of the visible spectrum. Um, otherwise, we are susceptible to infrared light. Um, in between the filter uh, and the sensor, you've got a small gasket. And basically that gasket is supposed to allow air movement, uh, but keep all the other dust and things like that out. Uh, there are some cameras out there that have been modified to allow for infrared light. Uh, and anytime that's done, at least at the phase one factory, uh, we replace that infrared filter with a clear piece of glass. So th there's always some sort of protection in between. Thanks. Um, and so, yeah, we have a question about um, some streaks on a filter that do not clean off. Um, we would have to kind of take a look at the specific uh, digital back in question. Um, but I do know, and John, you can also speak to this, that in some cases, uh, again, I don't know that this is the case in the particular question that was asked, um, but if that filter gasket um, is breached, you can get issues in between the filter and on the sensor itself, and that that's going to cause problems. Yeah, right, well, John? typically that would be uh, if, if you had dust under the filter. So um, when you look at spots, uh, particularly within you know Capture One, like we're doing now, or you see them some visually, uh, when you can't clean it, um, it's either something that's incredibly stubborn. Uh, it could be a small pinhole scratch, or it could be something underneath the filter. And it takes a little bit of practice knowing which is which, but um, if that gasket has been broken, uh, the most common reason that gasket would break would be uh, using uh, compressed air or canned air uh, to clean a filter. That's when we typically start to see dust getting underneath there. Yep. And now we're going we're gonna to go to the next step here, and we'll talk about uh, kind of what you want to use to clean your sensor once you get it directly off of the, the camera. All right. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now, and I'm going to go to my overhead camera in just a second. So digital back, of course, uh, I'm going to untether. I'm going to turn off the digital back, and then I'm just going to remove it from the XT. And let me switch to the overhead view here. Um, can somebody just chime in? Are we able to see that properly? Okay, great. All right. And I'm going to take the sensor, and now we can see it's exposed here. Um, as we go over to the digital back presentation, we're going to start with a dry cleaning. Right, and when I say dry, I mean that we're not using any chemicals or any liquids, um, and that is 
super straightforward. All that means is we're going to use a rocket blower to blow any sort of large, loose dust particles off there. Um, and so like the big fuzzy that you saw before on that uh, presentation that I had on my Capture One screen, that's an example of something that would almost definitely blow off with a rocket blower here. Um, as John mentioned, you absolutely do not want to use any kind of compressed air. Um, you know, any camera store is gonna have one of these rocket blowers. Um, the reason that these are good is because they have valves, and so as you fire the air out, they're going to fill from the back. They're not just going to blow the same dust in and out. And so that's really the key. Um, a is that you want to have something with a valve on there that's not going to blow the same dust in and out. And B, uh, of course, you don't want something with compressed air that has God knows what propellants in it and is going to apply uh, an, an amount of pressure to the sensor that could potentially breach that gasket. All right. John, any, any comments there you want to you bring in? Yeah, and, and the other thing that I, I want to bring up in particular, and again, let me jump back to the presentation here just so you can see. You know, we're going to talk about the dry cleaning, which we just kind of covered there. Then we're going to talk about the wet cleaning with the different chemicals that you may have seen, and then a spot cleaning. Um, but these are not things that you have to do every single time, right? Um, you saw the way that we checked the sensor uh, with our LCC plates, right? You can do that at any time during the testing phase, right? So after you blow your dust off, um, if you check it and it looks clean after that, you don't have to do any of this other stuff. It's sort of like an escalation scenario where if it's not clean after you use the bottle rocket, then you want to try the wet cleaning. And if it's still not clean after you do the wet cleaning, then you want to try the spot cleaning, all right? And so you don't have to do all these steps all the time. And, you know, the less that you do, the, the better, right? So that's just one thing to quickly keep in mind there. But now let's go over to the wet cleaning. All right. Now, for those of you that have been using Phase 1 Digital Backs for a while, you will be used to seeing a few of these things here. All right. Um, so this will likely be very familiar to you. Um, I know it's there's, there's no detail on here, so it's kind of blown out. But... On this edge, you have a you know, piece of plastic that is the same size as my full frame sensor, my full frame 645 sensor like I have here, right? And on this side, it's kind of tapered down, and that's going to be the same size as my crop sensor, so my 44 by 33 sensors. Um, all modern phase one digital backs that are currently in production are now full frame, so you're going to use this side. Um, but if you have an older legacy back, you've got this side available, all right? And you have these wipes, and what you'll do is carefully taking one of these wipes. You don't want to touch the part of it that you're going to be using on the sensor. You just go over it there. And then that right there would be the part that you would use on the sensor. Okay. Um, you know, in terms of cleaning, when you have this sort of um, square wipes, it's probably better to fold it in half first and then fold it over yep. um, the, the scraper itself. That way it gives more protection. Uh, so you have more cloth on the, the filter uh, of the sensor uh, so that it doesn't come through the cloth. All right, thank you, Joe. There you go. So fold it in half and go that way, okay? I'm touching this one because we're not gonna be using this. I wanna show you uh, what the newer kits are gonna have. Um, they're gonna have these individually sealed plastic uh, cleaning scrapers. Um, I say scrapers, they're not gonna scrape your sensor. Um, that's just the name that we use for them. Uh, they have an individual uh, cloth uh, sort of head Pre uh, covering them, um, and they're they're sized for the filter itself. So these are specially designed. These are what you're going to get with the newer 
um, digital backs. And if you if you buy a cleaning kit from us, this is what you're going to get now. Um, so this stuff here is kind of like the, the legacy solutions. So these absolutely work. Uh, and if you're used to using these, these still do the job. Um, this is the sort of newer, more user-friendly uh, method that we're going to be showing here. Uh, and this is available, uh, of course, through us and with all new digital packs. So those are the solutions. Uh, I'm sorry, those are the, the physical objects you're going to use. Now let's talk a little bit about the solutions. OK, so if you've used, again, those older cleaning kits, you're going to see we've got this blue bottle here. Can you guys see it? It's, it's kind of blue. OK, so you've got this blue bottle. It says solution A. And then you'll have a bottle just like this one that's going to be clear and will say solution B. Now, of course, that, that is you know, you assume that you would use A before you use B. John, you want to chime in here on uh, on this one? One of the big misnomers about solution A and solution B was this idea that you should always start with A and go to B. Um, that was true if you had really, really nasty stuff that just couldn't be cleaned off. Um, what we always kind of suggested to people was use the clear solution first, and then, only then, if you really couldn't get something off with it, go back to the B. And the reason you do it in that order is that that blue stuff is a, is a detergent. Uh, it's, it's pretty thick. It's, it's soapy. Um, and so when you put that on, you have to do five, six, seven passes with the clear solution just to get the, the old blue solution off. So it was, it was a lot of work, and it really only applied to maybe 5% of all cleanings. So if you have the old cleaning kit, um, you're going to want to use solution B. And I apologize, I don't have the, the clear bottle for solution B, so I'm just kind of showing this Eclipse fluid bottle here. Um, but you'd want to use the solution B first. Check your sensor and see if that takes care of your problem. If it doesn't, then you're going to want to go to the blue detergent-based solution. All right. Um, for the newer kits, there are some newer chemicals which are much less of an issue to use. Again, these are the ones that are going to come with the plastic scraper here. Um, so just so you can kind of see how these are arranged, if I got the older kit, I would have these chemicals with it. If I got the newer kit, um, I would have these little bottles with it. So I've got my blue cap here, and I've got my green cap here. And so the blue solution is called VisiDust Plus, and that's going to be the solution that I use first. I apologize, my radiator just rattled there. Uh, so I'm going to say that again. The VisiDust Plus is the solution that I'm going to use first. Then I have my equivalent of that sort of detergent-based cleaner, and this is my sensor clean, which is in the green bottle. Um, You'll see that it's not blue. It is a different solution, um, and it is designed to be easier to get off of the sensor. All right. So that's one of the nicer things about the new cleaning kit as well is it's formulated you know differently, uh, and it's supposed to be easier to take off. Um, one of the interesting things, and just a quick note here, is if you ever mix these up um, with detergents, if you shake them, you'll get bubbles. Um, and the VisiDust Plus doesn't generate bubbles when you shake it, so that's a quick way to be able to tell the difference between the two, um, if for some reason you ever lose track of that. But um, now that we have our solutions and we know what we're doing here, let's go to how we're going to actually clean our sensor. All right. So I'm going to take my scraper, and first I'm going to clean off my area. You always want to keep as much stuff out of the way as possible. All of these are going to be individually sealed. So I'm going to unpackage this guy here. Remember, I'm going to start with my blue solution. So nothing is ever going to go directly onto the sensor. No liquid is ever going to go directly onto the sensor. I'm going to very carefully 
apply this solution to the edge of my scraper here. And then I'm going to go directly into the corner. And remember, the scraper is sized perfectly for these. And I'm going to swipe across in one fluid motion. And I'm going to do that a couple of times. Okay. I can apply a good amount of pressure to this. John, you want to you want to talk a little bit about that and why not to be concerned about that? Yeah, uh, one of the big things is that the um, the quality of the glass is very good. Uh, it's fairly thick um, and it's very strong. So you're not going to uh, damage it by placing too much pressure. Um, I mean, yeah, if you put it in a vise or something like that, but uh, with the pressure you're, you're going to be able to apply with with a slob, um, you're not going to hurt it. Uh, just make sure that you don't have any sort of loose debris on it that you would be scraping across it, uh, and you're going to be okay. Um, in fact, the more pressure that you put, the better a job it's going to do cleaning. Yeah. Um, I see a quick question. Um, so the uh, question is, how much solution was applied to the swab? And that's a great question. Um, you'll see that it's it's very little. Uh, and again, this is the green stuff. So we'll go back to the blue stuff. Um, It'll, it'll come out drop by drop, and as you sort of touch it to the scraper on your own kit, you'll see that um, it takes that drop and it absorbs it like, you know, nice and, and large across the, the head. So you just want to go basically drop by drop until you've covered the entire edge and you'll be able to see uh, that it's wet, okay? Um, another question is, did I flip the scraper over before the second wipe? I did not. Um, so the the I did I when I applied it I flipped it over there because the fluid is going to be on that side but I didn't flip it over for the second wipe and and John you you typically don't do that right you just go in the same direction a couple of times correct yeah. okay so let me make sure those are all the questions um, okay. So here's a question. If it's okay to apply pressure to the glass during the cleaning, why is it so sensitive to compressed air? Yeah, I can take that. Uh, it it's basically has to do with the, the, the direction of, of the pressure and the, and the nature of it. So it's, it's what we're concerned about with compressed air is breaking a, a gasket that's between the filter. Um, so putting pressure down on the filter won't affect the gasket. It's, it's that air coming in with, with great force from the side. Uh, that ends up breaking and, and putting a little hole in that, if you will. Thank you, John. Um, uh, next question was, do you use a fresh swab for the next solution? Um, I do. Uh, again, these cleaning kits come with multiple swabs, so you will have um, several of these available. Um, the reason for this is, um, and again, we kind of talked about this, the, the green solution is um, much easier, or the green bottle, it, the solution here is much easier to get off than the blue stuff, um, but you're going to have to uh, go back over it with, and, and uh, you may have seen one of the steps was reverse. Um, so what we're gonna do is if we use the green stuff, we're gonna go back over it with the blue stuff, and you'll have to use a different swab for that anyway. Um, so I always do keep separate separate swabs for each one. Okay. Um, Nick has a question. So he does this often, and he gets residue on the edges of the frame. So he runs the corner of the scraper along the edges. Um, so that that is pretty normal. John, is yeah. that also something that Ab you do? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and the reality is, is you can usually see if you have residue somewhere. So it's just a matter of getting it up. Again, all these... All of our cleaning solutions, old, new, um, are not going to, to hurt it. So you can actually sort of deviate a little bit from, from the instructions if you need to. Um, I actually often use the, the sort of the corner of the, uh, the swab surface if I have a really stuck on spot. And again, uh, all of that's fine. Okay. And we do have a request uh, to show the older cleaning system. Um, so not a problem. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and do exactly the steps that we talked about with a new swab. Um, so as Joe suggested, I'm going to go ahead and fold this guy here. 
in half. Right. And because I'm using a full frame sensor here, I'm going to fold it over like so and pull it nice and taut to the edges, making sure that I don't touch the part that I'm going to apply my solution to. Sorry. There we go. Um, I'm, I'm going to use the VDust Plus here, just the same solution uh, that we used before. But again, it's the, the same procedure where I'm just going to kind of apply it drop by drop until I see that it's soaked up everything. And then I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to start in one corner, and I'm going to apply some pressure and just swipe all the way across in one fluid motion. And I'm going to do that again one more time. All right, so let's just check your questions. Okay, so we talked about how much we apply. We rotated the scraper, uh, or rather we didn't. We talked about that we don't rotate it and don't need to. We use a fresh swab for the green. Um, we talked about why it's okay to apply pressure. We talked about getting the residue off the edges. That's totally fine. And we covered the older print system. Okay. All right. So um, this is Joe here uh, from Support. One thing I'd like to add is that if you have an older system with the older uh, kind of the, the scraper, just to make sure you take good care of it, because over time those edges sometimes gets not as smooth. And we have seen where those edges, when they're not smooth, it can leave, it can leave streaks when you're cleaning it. So do take care of them. Um, and you know, if you need new ones or you can kind of clean that out, um, you know, maybe sand it down or something like that. But you know, if the edge is not smooth, that will affect how efficient the clean is. Yes. Thank you, Joe. Okay. So that's going to be our blue solution. Um, now at this point and at any point during the, uh, cleaning process, we can always go and check the sensor in exactly the same way that we did before with the LCC plate. Um, and so this is a point at which I would want to do that. Um, I'm going to skip that just because I want to show you the, the green solution and, and how to do that. It's exactly the same. Um, but again, this is sort of like a, an escalation process. So if when you check your sensor right now, after just doing the pass with the blue solution, it looks clean. You're good. There's no need to get you know this green stuff involved, or if you're using the older system, the you know the blue stuff involved, right? Because that's just going to create extra work for you, and you know increase the risk of, of you know causing any issues with the sensor. But just so we can kind of show you guys what we're going to do here, this was my swab that I was using with the blue. So I'm going to keep that organized there. And then I'm going to create, or create, I'm going to open up another swab here that I'm going to use with my green solution. And so just, you know, so you know, I mean, the, the blue solution is designed. I apologize. I'm going to wait for that to pass. So sorry about that. Can you guys hear me still? Everything good? Is it, is it clearer now, Joe? It's good? OK. All right. Uh, again, I apologize the department in Brooklyn. Um, so uh, the green solution is going to be for oil-based um, or sort of organic stains. Uh, whereas the blue solution is designed for water-based stains, so those are going to be more common. Um, but I'm going to do the exact same procedure. I'm going to go just kind of drop by drop until I, I fill up the entire swab. And then I'm going to take that side, and I'm going to go into the corner, and in the same direction, one fluid motion. All right? And if I need to go a second time, I can do that same thing in one pass. Okay? All right? And I'm going to take this and just make sure that I keep 
the swab separate. Okay, and we have a question, uh, is the equipped solution equally effective? Uh, John, you want to take that one? So, if we look at it, all of the solutions that we've provided over the years and that we've sort of partnered with, there's also a number of other solutions uh, on the market. Uh, what I usually tell people is they all work. They will all clean a filter. Um, the difference is, is that some are easier than others. Um, so the, the stuff that we're distributing now, the, the visible dust fluids, uh, are the best I've ever worked with. And, and what I mean by that is um, it's not that they make the sensor any cleaner, it's that they do it much quicker. You can do it in just a couple passes uh, without any streaks, uh, without anything sort of left over. Uh, whereas some of the, the uh, other fluids um, may be more inclined to leave some streaks depending on your technique. So uh, the Eclipse fluid still works great. Uh, I still use it uh, fairly frequently, um, but if I can use the, the visible dust, um, I can work much faster. Thanks. Um, and someone is asking a question. Uh, if you use a bright light, like a flashlight to inspect after you swiped, is that a good way to check for cleaning? Um, I, I think just to kind of take this one, um, you know, checking on the, on the, you know, in capture one with your LCC is always going to be the best way to check how it's going to impact your image. Uh, right. A absolutely. One of the things you can do with the, with the light and the idea with the light is that you hold it sort of flat across the surface uh, of the filter. And then anything that's sort of sticking up is going to be illuminated by it. So sometimes it, it's a, it's a good way to tell, um, if a, a, a spot that you're having trouble cleaning is on top of the filter, uh, is underneath the filter, uh, such as a, a piece of dust that got underneath, or is a, a scratch that sort of cuts down into the filter. So that's sort of the, the best usage of the light. Um, but certainly if you're not able to be sort of taking shots and putting them into Capture One, it's also a nice way to just to see what's on there. Great. Um, all right, and we had somebody ask, I think the question just disappeared, but um, is there a particular reason that you go in one direction, you know, continuously rather than switching back and forth between directions, John? Not the most crucial thing uh, about cleaning, but what's what's good about that is that you're always you're always pushing anything that might be on there the same direction. So uh, any residues, any things, um, any little pieces of dust that might get pushed, always get pushed to one side. Um, so it, it makes the process a lot simpler. Great. Uh, and then one more question we have here is I have one spot in my images, but I can't see anything on the sensor. It looks perfectly clean. Is it possible the spot is somewhere else? Um, that is a great question. Um, I would have to kind of see the images to judge that because um, spots at different parts in your optical system uh, will show up, absolutely, and they'll typically show up in different ways. Um, another thing to kind of keep in mind um, is that when you have a lens, uh, the images are actually going to be projected upside down and the sensor reflects that. Um, and of course, if you're using like a, an SLR, the pen version corrects for that. If you're using uh, um, a mirrorless, that's again done digitally. Um, but you know, if you see a spot uh, in one of your images, it's possible that it may be, you know, on the opposite side of the sensor, um, top to bottom. Uh, I don't believe left to right, but top to bottom potentially. Um, if if you're not seeing it, that may be one reason why. Um. Okay. I'll just answer Paul's question really quick where he's saying uh, about shooting between f11 and f16 and noticing that smaller apertures show more dust. Um, that's absolutely true. Uh, for instance, if you shoot a, a, at 2.8, uh, you may not be able to see the dust uh, very well at all. Um, that said, uh, internally, we do all of our uh, official testing at f11. And the reason is, is that once you get down to f16 or f22, um, the sharpness of the light will begin to highlight things that um, may just be part of the natural coatings of the filter uh, and things that, that would not be possible to clean or um, you will drive yourself uh, absolutely nuts trying to clean. Yeah, 
And, and again, another thing to keep in mind here uh, is that you know, the goal of having a clean sensor is to make sure that our images that we are actually capturing are you know, not having these defects in them. Um, but the things that we're doing to these files are absolutely brutal, right? So a lot of times these little defects are, are not going to impact our real world images. Um, so obviously this is something we want to address when we're cleaning our sensors. We want them to be as clean as possible. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it's important, you know, you, you can be, you know, you can spend an entire day or more trying to clean off your sensor and, and drive yourself absolutely crazy, right, John? Uh, the biggest thing that I tell people when cleaning, especially if you're using the LCD shot method to see what's there and you're comparing before and after, always look that, don't expect absolute perfection in the after shot because unless you're working in a clean room, there's always something that's going to sort of fall on there before you put it in. There might be a little bit of dust inside the camera that, that floats up on it. Uh, what you're really looking for is that, that all the major stuff is gone and that of the little minor things, they're not in the same position. In other words, anything on the, on the after shot should be new compared to the before. And that tells you that you did a, a, a good cleaning in between. Okay. So just to kind of keep things moving here, um, we're going to move on. If you have any questions, you can continue to put them in the chat and we'll, we'll address those uh, with the moderators as we go on. Um, but now we're going to, you know, now that we've done our sort of deep cleaning with the green solution here, um, we want to make sure that we've gotten rid of any residue from that solution. And so to do that, we're going to reverse back through our steps, right? Uh, so I'm going to go back to my blue solution and I'm going to use that to clean off any residual um, green solution that might be on there. And by the way, between any of these steps, um, I do like to go in there with the, the dust blower just to make sure that if there's anything that's fallen on there, I'm not going to be dragging it across the sensor. Um, the dust blower is your friend. Okay. So again, I'm just going to recoat my scraper for the blue stuff. Okay. And Exact same thing that I've been doing, just one fluid motion across the sensor. Okay. And we're done. Okay. And again, if you look through our steps, uh, as the last bit of our reversal, we're just going to go one last time with our dust blower and we are ready to recheck our sensor. So I'm going to switch back. All right. I put it back on the XT. Um, and I'm going to re-tether up. Grab my LCC plate here. And of course, turning the digital back on is always a helpful thing to do. Let me jump back to capture one here. Share my screen. Okay, and you can see that our digital back is now connected. I'm going to take my plate, put it right up against the lens there and capture. And hang on, I'm gonna go to F11 here, as John said, um, just so we're following. The approved method. All right, and I'm going to reset any adjustments, go back, create a new LCC, and do my little auto levels again. And you're going to see that my before 
to my after. Um, you know, don't pay any attention to the colors here. That's just because I have auto level set to a particular setting. Um, but it's much cleaner. There are no big spots on there. And the little spots that are on there are, again, in different locations, right? So it's it's not as if I've, I've got something that's really stuck on there. There's maybe a little bit of dust that fell on there or was inside the camera. Um, but uh, that's not an issue, OK? Um, now, John, real quick, I know I know someone's going to ask about this. So if you look very carefully at the image here, um, you can see that there's kind of a split in the sensor here. Do you want to explain what that what's happening there? Uh, yeah, um, it, essentially, what you start to see is uh, various aspects of the makeup of sensors, uh, as well as how images get. Uh, balanced uh, on the computer. So uh, you're starting to see aspects of the, the sensor production as well as the sensor uh, calibration. Um, if you think about what uh, our knobs done with the auto levels is we've taken something that would normally span, uh, you know, zero to 255 and, and we've narrowed it down to a range of about 40. Uh, in a lot of scenarios, you might be narrowing that down to a range of about 10. So uh, you're going to accentuate yeah, every little thing about the sensor in the file. So don't be concerned about the weird things that you see when you do a, a full auto levels. Yep. All right. OK, so we have our sensor. Uh, it looks nice and clean, and we should be good to go. Um, at this point, um, let's go through and answer any other questions and then we're going to move on to uh, another topic specifically for ccd sensors that are going to be column errors um okay and we're going to go let's see when making the lcc you do not select dust correct and that is absolutely correct uh we don't want to do any additional corrections uh we, we want to see everything that's on there without capture one trying to make our images look nicer. Um, Dennis was asking, the three-handled swaps come in a kit. Are they used once and throw away, or can they accept new wipes? Um, so I believe if you're talking about, um, if you're talking about these guys here, um, typically, I mean, John, we have enough of these that we use them once and throw them away. Uh, what is your? recommendation for reusing or not reusing those? So they they are basically single-use swabs. Now, exactly what is a single-use uh, sort of depends on the situation. Uh, if I have three digital backs in front of me that I'm cleaning uh, and they're not, you know, covered in, in grime, they're relatively clean to begin with, um, I can probably use the, the same swab or two uh, across all three of those in that usage setting. But what I'm not going to do is I'm not going to try to package it back up and come back to it a week later when I want to go clean again. Um, so, you know, if, if you're cleaning a couple things, uh, you might be able to use it on more than one. If you're cleaning something that's really dirty to begin with, uh, you know, then it may simply be that single, single use. Because um, what we don't want to do is we don't want to pick up other dirt along the way and start bringing that into the cleaning process. Absolutely. Um, and, and just in case you were asking about these guys here, um, these you are applying a new fresh wipe every time. Um, so these pieces are, are absolutely reusable because they're never actually coming in direct contact with the sensor or any of the dust or anything. Um, so that is one of the advantages of the older system. But again, um, it's not as user friendly as the new swabs. And um, if you do need a new kit or new swabs, we always have those available. Um, again, minus the whole pandemic situation. <laughs> um, but uh, we're, we're, of course, able to provide you with a, a full kit of those. So uh, change slide. OK. Um, all right. So uh, you guys can see my slideshow again. Um, I'm going to move on to the next topic. But as you can see, we've gone through all of our steps. We've checked our sensor with the LCC method. 
Uh, we did our dry clean with the dust blower. We did our wet clean with the um, blue solution and sort of our spot clean with the green solution. Um, we then went back through everything in reverse and we checked it and confirmed that everything was clean. Okay. So our next topic is going to be column errors. Okay. Um, and so column errors, just to talk quickly about what they are, um, you can see hopefully in the image on the right that there is one vertical line um, that is sort of standing out from the rest. It's white where the rest are, are just kind of all kinds of colors. Um, that is what we refer to when we say a column error, and that will show up in files if you really, really abuse them, kind of as we did with the files that we were doing when we were checking the sensor. And there are tons of different things that can cause a column error. Um, and John actually has some fun stories on those if you want to uh, hop in here, John. The CMOS based digital backs. So the 50 megapixel, 100 megapixel, 150 megapixel backs will not happen. This is limited to CCDs. Um, and uh, they are fairly common in the older Kodak CCDs, like the P40 Cloud Plus, P25 Plus, et cetera. Very uncommon in the DALSA CCDs, which would have been the, the 60 megapixel or the 80 megapixel. Um, but basically, they can be caused by a, a variety of things, everything from a, a pixel that's not responsive, uh, a full row that has become unresponsive, uh, or even some of the little bits of, of wiring that read out the data if one of those uh, has sort of a physical break in it over time. That could that could produce a column error as well. What would you do to fix it? Um, well, what we would actually do is, is we do a recalibration. Um, so we we essentially take a uh, make a map of the sensor, and the map says this is where we're not getting good data. So use other information to fill in the gap. Um, that's the correct way to do it. Uh, in theory, uh, and, and I'm not actually making this up, this is true, uh, if it's a physical connection break, um, it could in theory be fixed with a, a little bit of heat. Um, so, you know, bake it in the oven, 200 degrees, 20 minutes, uh, might fuse that link back together. Um, just to be clear, I don't recommend doing that. <laughs> Uh, under any that, that will void your warranty, um, but there there are a bunch of videos that uh, Phase One did. I think with the P, the earlier P series, uh, where they like baked it in a cake, they put it in dry ice, they had an elephant step on it. Um, so these these things are, are pretty uh, pretty durable. Uh, again, we don't recommend these things, but um, you know just some some fun things that Phase has done with these. Um, and so, so that's you know kind of what a column error is, uh, why they happen. There are many reasons, but let's look at how we would find these uh, in, in our files, uh, and then we'll talk about how we deal with them. So, what we would want to do is, and, and I apologize, I don't have a CCD back here. Um, as John said, these are exclusively, um, you know, uh, they exclusively occur due to the architecture of the CCD backs. Um, and uh, so I, I can't show you uh, a file that I'm shooting, but just to go over the, um, the procedure that I would do is I would turn up the ISO on the digital back. About 800 is, uh, is good. Again, for the CCD sensors, 800 is quite high. Um, then I would do the same exact thing with my LCC plate, this little light translucent plexi, uh, and I would shoot it underexposed about two stops, just using the meter and whatever camera that I have. And then, uh, you know, I would put the file in the Capture One, I would push it back up to uh, sort of an even exposure, and I should get an image that is just a ton of noise, um, like the one that you see uh, to the right there. And uh, that is where my column errors are going to pop out at me. Um, and, uh, you know, if there are errors, I'll be able to see them there. If there aren't, which hopefully there, there aren't, uh, then it should just look like a bunch of noise. Um, and uh, so that's how you would identify your column errors. Um, and when you do that, if you take a look at that and you do see column errors, um, obviously we want to get those fixed. So what you would do is you would pack your file as an EIP 
and I'll quickly just kind of hop back to my screen here. Uh, stop sharing. There your screen, application. Okay, so I'll go back to capture one here and I have, this is my, my file that I shot uh, that we have for um, a P25, I believe. This is a P25 plus. Um, and so I'm going to take this and I've applied an LCC and push the exposure and you can see that my column errors are showing up here. Um, and actually you'll see that in this case they're horizontal um, I believe in the really old uh, digital backs, the readout circuitry was horizontal. Um, on the newer digital backs, it's along the vertical axis. Um, so you'll notice a difference in, in that respect. If you have an older digital back, it doesn't make a difference. It's, it's exactly the same uh, procedure. And then you would just take that, right click it, pack as an EIP. And that's actually not super important. I mean, we can take this file and do it ourselves. And then you would just take that file and you'd email it to us at support at digitaltransitions.com. Okay. At that point, Joe, do you wanna hop in and talk a little bit about what would happen? Uh, the file itself, um, what can happen is that we start a case with phase one they take a look at the file, and if they can map, remap the sensor based on the file you send, we can do a, the, a remote calibration uh, in that sense. Is that we'll get a calibration file. The file will need to then be uh, kind of ingested into the digital back uh, through the Firewire um, port uh, through the firmware updater. But you know that's the detail. The, the main thing is that once you identify the column error, give us a call, and uh, we can see what we can do whether it's a remote calibration or on-site cal uh, on calibration or factory calibration. Great. Um, so yeah, I mean, that that pretty much uh, is, is the other um, little thing that we wanted to cover that you might see. Um, I know that, and, and we'll just quickly acknowledge this. Um, I think in some of the emails that we initially sent out, we were gonna talk a little bit about uh, what we call quadrant errors. Um, a quadrant error, and again, there's this is something that um, you can see, and let me switch back to my screen share here. Um, we're not gonna spend a ton of time talking about this um, because there are any number of reasons why it could show up, and um, sometimes it's just file by file. Sorry, application window, capture one. Um, but you can see where I've just straight up got a, a spot on the sensor that has split into you know uh, quadrants along the sensor taps uh, that are the different spots that you see in the sensor. Um, if you've ever looked at uh, you know uh, a CCD sensor in particular, you'll have noticed these. So John, do you want to just quickly mention what these are? Uh, yeah. So what you have on on the CCDs in particular, um, you know, let's say in this case, I think this is a this is either a sixty or an eighty megapixel CCD. Uh, it has four different readout sections uh, that split the sensor up into basically eight little um, rectangles. Uh, it's all one sensor. It, you're just seeing the readout architecture of it, how, how we actually get the data off. And so each one of those uh, has different gain settings that have to be calibrated together. Um, and if we had a bad calibration or a calibration sort of failed over time, you might start to see one uh, one or two sections of that sensor sort of reading out a little brighter, a little darker, or a slightly different color. Um, that said, uh, anytime you do see these sort of quadrants show up, uh, there's a lot of different reasons for that. And so each one we kind of investigate individually. Um, some of those reasons could be it needs a new calibration. Others could be it actually has an okay calibration, but we've we've pushed the, uh, the image making um, capabilities just a little bit too far. We had too steep of an angle of light. Um, this image is actually really clever uh, <laughs> because believe it or not, this quadrant is being uh, created by uh, Capture One. 
Um, the image was actually produced okay, uh, but because we know that these quadrants can occur under certain circumstances, there's lots of little fixes that are built in the Capture One to detect those and suppress those. Uh, so this is actually a unique scenario where if we uh, tweak the image editing process under the hood in Capture One, we can make these quadrants disappear. Um, so I think that you know uh, if there are, if there are any additional questions, I, I think uh, now is the time uh, to address those. Um, but that's the end of our presentation uh, and sort of our demonstration here. Um, so yeah, if you have any questions for uh, myself or John or Joe, um, I'm going to switch back over to the regular chat and. Um, Let's see. Are there are there any additional questions that you guys have for us, um, moderators? I'm waiting for you to highlight them if there are. All right. Um, I am not seeing anything else. Um, again, we really appreciate you guys, uh, you know, spending your time with us. Uh, we know there are a number of things that you can be doing, uh, and we really love having you guys here. Um, if you have any additional questions, uh, you can contact us um, at, uh, at uh, I mean, info at digital transitions, uh, and then uh, our sales reps uh, can give you their info as well. Um, there are plenty of ways to contact us. We're, we're always happy to help uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. And um, please sign up for our future webinars. Uh, we've got plenty coming up. I think our next one is uh, an artist talk by uh, one of our clients, Adam Elstein, uh, who is going to be covering tech cameras, which is really, really uh, an interesting topic. Uh, and especially for you folks that haven't used them, um, you know, that is, uh, that's going to be interesting to kind of see what they are. Um, and I see that there are a couple last questions coming in. Uh, can I show the LCC plates again? Um, let me stop sharing my screen just so you can see the full thing. Uh, this is the LCC plate. Um, it's just a white piece of Plexi. Um, it comes with a digital back kit. We also sell them separately if you need another one. Um, you don't have to use a specific plate. It can, it can be any piece of translucent plastic. Uh, the goal is just to obscure any image that's on the other side of it while allowing light through to the sensor. Um, when it comes to cleaning the lenses with isopropyl alcohol, um, honestly, I, I so first of all, number one is when you're cleaning anything, you want to see how much you can get done with just blowing, you know, like a bottle rocket on there. Um, if you have stains on them, um, I, I typically and John, if you want to chime in on this, my philosophy is if it's good enough to clean a sensor, it's good enough to clean anything else. Um, so personally, I will actually just use a microfiber cloth and a little bit of the eclipse fluid on there. Is that overkill, John, or do you have feedback on no, that? No, I, I think that's great. Um, the only thing you want to be careful about it with, with sort of any solution that you're using is uh, if you look at like a lot of the sensor fluids that, that contain isopropyl alcohol, it's isopropyl alcohol plus water, so it's still diluted. Um, I, I don't know that I'd go straight alcohol on it, but uh, um, uh, to be honest, uh, I've never tried, so I, I can't speak to the uh, to the downside of it. Yeah, um, and the the other thing too is just to be careful um, when you're. One of the reasons that we do uh, go across on the sensor, uh, and then we don't kind of get in there and really dig at it um, is because you do have coatings on all of these sensors, uh, anti-reflection coatings, and so that is also going to be on any of your lenses. Um, so that is uh, is something to keep in mind is you know, if you're doing cleaning on your lenses, you always want to try and do like fluid motions as opposed to like scraping it on there. Um, so just something to keep in mind if you're, if you're doing that. Um, hmm. 
If you don't have an LCC plate, could you point your camera at a blank wall and defocus it to generate an LCC image? Um, I mean, John, the key is just not having an image on top of the light that's coming into your sensor, right? Correct, correct, yeah. The idea is you just don't want to see other stuff that can use it for dust. I mean, the dust is going to be there regardless. So, uh, yeah, you, you absolutely could do that. To a blank wall, and there's any sort of imperfection on that wall by using an LCC and uh, squash the contrast, any sort of imperfection on that wall is going to show up as well. So that becomes a little bit difficult to pin, uh, finding out the difference between whether it's a dust on the center or just an imperfection on the wall. So you, you know that's something that you might have uh, might have issue running into. But the the defocus point that you made in that question, Stephen, is also important. Uh, yeah, if you want to avoid having an image on your sensor, and particularly any little dots, um, you want to make sure that your lens is not focused sharply on the plane. Uh, there, with the LCC plate, it's a non-issue, but if you're shooting a wall and you don't have anything like that, that's that's a good point. You want to defocus it. All right. Um, so that that's pretty much it. Uh, I think if there are any additional questions, you can email them to us. Uh, Kate, do you want to put a contact link uh, in the chat? I'm not sure if there is one. I'm sure you, you've done that already, but um, Kate will put one in there. You'll get a follow-up survey, by the way, for the webinar. Um, we really do appreciate your feedback. We tried our best to incorporate a lot of that feedback from the previous one into this one. Um, if you think it went better, we'd like to know that as well. So any kind of feedback, positive, negative, neutral, is good for us to have. So. Um, that's it for today, and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll see you guys again soon. Thank you.